In the combined issue of Jack for November 19th, November 26th, they have a state-of-the-art paper on stent thrombosis with drug-eluting stents, is the paradigm shifting? And I am with uh, Dr. Greg Stone, professor of medicine at Columbia University. He's also, of course, Presbyterian Hospital and a founder of the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, who bring us TCT. Thank you very much for the meeting, first off. It looks like a great one. Let's talk about this paper in Jack. Uh, in the ESC meeting at 2006, as your paper calls it, a firestorm hit, where they talked about drug eluting stents and late, late stent thrombosis. Start there and then let's come through to where you think the paradigm is shifting. Sure. Well, we've really been on a roller coaster in terms of the uh, efficacy and safety of drug eluting stents over the last decade. And initially, drug-eluting stents came out. They were thought to be the cure-all, um, as Patrick Soroy's described, his ro rosy prophecy being uh, realized. And then we found out it wasn't perfectly rosy, that there were issues with drug-eluting stents, in particular the concept of very late stent thrombosis, sudden stent thrombosis occurring after the first year of the implant came out. And that's because they're so effective at inhibiting healing, that is the restenosis process, they also lead to a greater rate of lack of endothelialization. So you can get late stent thrombosis. And Dr. Renu Vermani kept saying, I told you this was a possibility. Well, Dr. Vermani always says, I told you so, and she's usually right. I will give her that. So um, there was a, a, a particular meeting at the ESC, which we've now come to know as the firestorm of ESC in 2006, where some meta-analyses were first put together, suggesting that very late events in particular were increased in patients who got first-generation drug-eluting stents compared to bare metal stents. And this was all because of this issue of very late stent thrombosis. This led to a, a large panel at the FDA being convened and to increase the recommended duration of dual antiplatelet therapy therapy from initially three to six months all the way up to 12 months, even though there was no good data about this. It also led to drug eluting, eluting stent use um, diminishing throughout the world, even though they're clearly effective. So now we have second generation drug eluting stents, and I think that industry has responded to those safety concerns. We learned that in many cases they were because of late polymer hypersensitivity reactions, the thickness of the stent strut, um, and, and other issues that were um, promoting either strut fracture and or neoatherosclerosis and causing the late events. And we now have a new generation of drug eluting stents. I would say at the pinnacle of the list in terms of safety are the class of fluoropolymer coated um, drug eluting stents, eluding the drug Everolimus for the most part, and several of the manufacturers make these. And now, interestingly, that we've got uh, studies in tens of thousands of patients, randomized trials, it looks like these are not only as safe as bare metal stents, but may even be safer. And that would truly represent a paradigm shift if a drug eluting stent had lower rates of stent thrombosis and late events than a bare metal stent. What's the mechanistic underpinnings of that particular approach and the fact that we may have some better stents now? Well, you know, it's not known for sure, but I think at the top of everybody's list is the properties of the fluoropolymer. For many, many years, it's been known that fluoropolymers are inherently thromboresistant and platelet resistant. And they've been used in multiple different medical applications, and they're known to have very, very clean surfaces. And um, Elazar Edelman and his laboratory at MIT has done some, I think, very important basic science research showing that if you coat a bare metal stent with a fluoropolymer, it is, again, more thromboresistant and platelet resistant than its bare metal stent counterpart. And this is likely to underlie the greater freedom from late stent thrombosis and very late stent thrombosis. So in all these meta-analyses now, the fluoropolymer coated drug eluting stents uh, come out as the safest. Where are we going with the third generation stents now? Do we even need them given the fact that you know the, we have polymers that disappear, we have stents that completely yeah. disappear? Is bioresorbable out? Is there any need for that? Yeah. Well, I say the answer is no, and we clearly need better devices. We still have restenosis, and we still have stent thrombosis, both early and late, even with the latest generation of devices. And there's a lot of reasons mechanistically this might be, um, but having a foreign body, whether it's a polymer and or a metallic device, in the coronary artery may not be a good thing. First of all, it, if you have a metallic 
scaffold or metallic stent in the artery, you can't have normal vasoconstriction, vasodilatation responses. That's number one. It straightens out the vessel. It, you get abnormal cyclic strain relief, uh, areas of uh, low shear stress, which can be atherogenic and promote neoatherosclerosis. You've got a tendency towards late strut fractures, and every polymer at some point can have some late hypersensitivity reactions to it. So there is a, a great interest in either reducing the polymer load or getting rid of it entirely. So metallic stents with either bioabsorbable polymers or totally polymer-free stents. And if you engineer these with actually enhanced metal surface properties, now you may even take it one step further. So for example, a stent that we're very, very interested in is the Synergy stent um, that one of the manufacturers makes that's a platinum chromium core. And it's got a very small load of a um, PLGA polymer, which is gone within about three months, leaving this platinum chromium stent behind, which seems to be even more thromboresistant even than fluoropolymer coated stents. There's been no large studies with it yet, so we'll see when the large studies come out, but that's one approach. The second major approach is to have a fully bioresorbable vascular scaffold, where in the space of six months to two years, the device itself dissolves, allowing the vessel to achieve, one, vasomotion again, and two, its normal conformability, restoring it ideally to its native pristine state, but just without the plaque and with a wide open lumen. And this may be able to decrease the um, ongoing rate of target lesion failure related events that we see with all metallic prostheses, whether bare metal, first generation DES, or second generation DES. So with the shifting paradigm, how does it shift the clinical use of drug eluting stents? Well, I think what we've seen is now drug eluting stent use increase again. And to the United States, it's, it's in the mid to high 80s. And with perhaps ST segment elevation MI kind of being the one holdout where we're, people still question the relative safety and efficacy, but there'll be some large studies, I think, starting to, to show that, notably the Horizons 2 AMI trial. So I think with the concept that these are safer, people are feeling more comfortable taking advantage of the anti restenotic properties of these newer generation drug eluting stents. We still are saddled with the one year recommendation for dual antiplatelet therapy, and there's emerging data that suggests that stopping at six months or even three months may be safe. But there's a variety of, of ongoing randomized trials that are looking at ultra long term dual antiplatelet therapy and then ultra short term dual antiplatelet therapy, which will be reported over the next several years. What do you use as far as antiplatelet therapy? Three months, six months, a year? It depends. First of all, it depends on whether it's an acute coronary syndrome or not. If it's an acute coronary syndrome, I think there's very good data that independent of the PCI procedure itself, longer is better in terms of dual antiplatelet therapy. And um, with low dose aspirin and ticagrelor probably being the best regimen. So those patients I keep on for at least one year. And if they're tolerating it well, depending on the complexity of their vascular disease, perhaps longer. Uh, for stable coronary artery disease, I'm very comfortable with six months of aspirin and clopidogrel, no evidence for either ticagrelor or prasgrel in stable coronary disease at the present time. Well, thank you, Dr. Stone, for the state-of-the-art paper. And as I said, it's in Jack, the combined November 19th, 26th issue. Please go check it out, the changing paradigms of drug-eluting stents and uh, late stent thrombosis. For Cardiosource World News, I'm Rick McGuire.